Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first of three special Pint of Science events, or what we like to call the Polar Pint of Science, brought to you by the UK Polar Network with Apex and the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust. It's great to have you here joining us tonight. I'm Camilla, and I'm the CEO of the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust. And it's my huge pleasure to be your host this evening as we travel together to Antarctica to explore the origins of Antarctic science in exploration untold. We want this to be an interactive event tonight, so we want to hear from you throughout the, throughout the show. So please do get in touch with, with us, either by contacting us by typing in your comments in the comments section um, below the video, or by using our hashtag on Twitter, which is hashtag Polar Pint of Science. Let us know where you're joining us from tonight. We want to know who is the farthest away from us and how you are joining us. So we look forward to hearing from you throughout the show. As I said, tonight is the first of three very special polar themed pints of science, which, which aim to shine a spotlight on the incredible science going on in the polar regions. Science which has and continues to enable our understanding of our planet. The UK Polar Network, which is an organization which brings together polar scientists from across the UK and the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust, a charity which preserves and shares the legacy of the pioneers of exploration and science in Antarctica, have come together to bring you a fascinating program which will explore the past, present and future of polar science, telling us some fascinating stories along the way. Tonight, uh, we look back as we, head to the, as we head to the farthest south. Our three speakers are all researchers looking at the contributions made by those scientists and explorers who have gone before us. When we were putting together this evening, uh, we were keen to take a very different view, uh, to use a different lens, if you like, to explore some of the maybe the lesser known stories of the origins of Antarctic science and to take a new look at some of the more well-known and consider their impact today. We have three exceptional speakers tonight who will give us new insights into our Antarctic past. After we've heard from our speakers, uh, we'll let them all speak first, we will bring them together for a Q&A when it will be turned, we will turn the tables and we'll, it will be your turn to pose your questions. So please use the comments section and pose those questions when they come to you. Um, and we will get through as many as we possibly can um, in the Q&A afterwards. So without further ado, um, first up, we have Alice Oates from the University of Cambridge Scott Polar Research Institute, who is studying the early history of the very famous Halley Research Station. And she's going to give us some insight into the life and science of this remarkable base. So Alice, it's great to have you with us tonight. Um, well, welcome. So everybody sit back, relax, and let's head farthest south. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, and in such good company with Daniela and Henrietta to share a piece of Antarctica with you today. Uh, as Camilla's just told you, I'm going to be talking about Halley Research Station, which is a British Antarctic survey station in West Antarctica. Uh, and uh, Halley is the subject of my PhD, and I'm hoping that in the next 10 minutes, I can persuade you that it's as interesting as I think it is. Pictured here is the, the first ever Halley um, from 1956 to 57. So I'm going to pour you a metaphorical pint of Halley today, starting with some of the science through the years, then the people, and then putting a few of the kind of fun, foamy things in there as well. It's useful for you to know a little bit about Halley and where it comes from before I get started. Halley was established by the Royal Society as part of the International Geophysical Year of 1957 to 58. The IGY, as I'll now refer to it, was an international program of geophysical science that stretched from pole to pole. Antarctica was a key focus for the IGY with scientific activity on the continent absolutely exploding in this time. And Halley was an important part of Britain's contribution. And the IGY wasn't just important because of the science. Before the IGY, states were in competition for Antarctica in very direct ways. Britain, Argentina and Chile had directly competing claims for the Antarctic Peninsula, for example, and the US and Soviet Union were starting to become worryingly interested if you were someone who already had a claim to the continent or thought you did. Um, people in the know were starting to smell trouble on the horizon. The IGY kind of put all that on hold temporarily. States could build research stations on any part of Antarctica and non-claimant states were able to engage in Antarctic science. It was also a collaborative program. Because of all of this, the IGY is often credited with enabling the signing of the Antarctic Treaty in 1959, which today still governs how we are allowed to behave in Antarctica, froze sovereign claims to the continent 
and is responsible for keeping Antarctica a peaceful continent where science is the primary activity. Uh, and just the main picture here is, is Halley 6, which is the current version of Halley, which you may have seen. It's kind of a very space age station known for its, its really unique architecture. Uh, so Halley came along at a really important time in Antarctic history and politics, and it also has an important and interesting scientific history. So Vossel Bay, which is the region of Antarctica Halley is situated in, was identified as a necessary place for a station by the special committee for the IGY, because it was really important to the scientific program at the time. Uh, and it's also not important in isolation. A large part of Halley's value is as a node in a wider network. And I'll get into some of the ways that that's true later on. So during the International Geophysical Year, the Royal Society expedition had a scientific mandate that included meteorology, geomagnetism, ionospherics, auroral studies, glaciology, seismology, oceanographic measurements, and physiological measurements. Uh, it doesn't necessarily matter what all of those actually mean, but it's just to show that from the very beginning, uh, Halley had a, a huge scientific mandate across a huge range of, of geophysical scientists, sciences. And I think it's important to stress that although this was less than 70 years ago, we still knew relatively little about Antarctica. In fact, we weren't sure still whether Antarctica was actually one continent or perhaps a series of islands. The IGOI was a real explosion of science that not only hugely expanded our understanding of Antarctica, but laid the groundwork for a lot of important science done since. And how these science has since evolved from that kind of fundamental, how does Antarctica work kind of science um, to increasingly applied science. But those long-term observation programs that started in 1956 have huge scientific value as well in, in ways that couldn't really have been predicted uh, when Halley was first established. The most famous uh, was the discovery of the hole in the ozone layer. And it was Halley data that first identified the existence of that hole, leading to the Montreal Protocol and banning of CFCs. And that wouldn't have happened unless we had this continuous record from the 1950s. And a bit of trivia for you, the same instrument, the Dobson spectrometer, used in the 1980s to identify the hole in the ozone layer is still in use today. So that's a nice bit of scientific continuity. However, uh, Halley is more than just an ozone observatory, and the work done there has significant value for the UK and the international community. As I mentioned, Halley's value partly comes from its position as part of a wider international network. For example, it's part of the World Meteorological Organization's Global Atmosphere Watch program, which is a network of stations providing information on the chemical composition of the atmosphere. There's also research that you might not expect to find uh, in Antarctica that's not about Antarctica itself, but goes a little bit broader. So research has been conducted by doctors at Halley into questions like how living in 24 hour darkness affects our bodies and minds. And there's even been work training station members to dock uh, a Soyuz capsule in order to study how those skills degrade over time in isolation and darkness, because Halley is in the winter is surprisingly similar to space flight. Um, and another big part of Halley science on that kind of similar theme is space weather research. The very low frequency receiver at Halley picks up radio waves used to identify space weather phenomena with relevance for important issues like protecting satellites from space weather and understanding its impact on the climate system. The British Antarctic Survey's space weather research through Halley has enabled international collaborations with numerous countries, um, for example, with the EU on spacecast and space storm projects to build a forecasting system for space weather. There's also a fun side to this work in which the frequencies picked up by the very low frequency receiver have been turned into audible sound. And if you Google the Sounds of Space project, you can listen to some of these sounds on the BAS website. And I'd really recommend it because it's just it's, it's a great listen. Uh, I thought you might also like to see what science looked like before it was done you know, on computers as we do it today. Halley's IGY program generated about 10 tons of data. That's, that's physical kind of data that they had to transport home. It's an awful lot of uh, forms and paperwork all meticulously filled in by the people um, in that first expedition. And of course, none of this science happens without people. And by this, I mean both scientists and the people who keep the station going, carpenters, mechanics, chefs, and so on. Halley was occupied year round every year until 2017, when a crack in the Brunt ice shelf 
uh, forced the station to be closed over winter. And there have been six Hallies, each bringing their own challenges and opportunities for station members. It's easy to stereotype Antarctica as a space for explorers and adventurers, imagining today's scientists as modern Scots and Shackletons, trudging heroically through icy landscapes with frosty beards. Unfortunately, uh, the reality is often a bit more boring. Uh, the work at Halley, while very important, as I've discussed, uh, is often very routine for the people working at the station and doesn't always provide the stimulation they need to keep their minds and bodies healthy, especially through the 24 hour darkness of the Antarctic winter. And through the years, there have therefore been a few things that have always been important to Halley people to keep them going. Food is a big one. The chef is a very important person in Antarctica. And beyond routine meals, Halley people often take any chance they can to celebrate an occasion. Even in the IGY hut, the first ever Halley base, they always made cakes for each other's birthday, which I, I love. Um, and the big celebration is Midwinter's Day. While Christmas is celebrated an in Antarctica, it's often around the time that the ship uh, arrives for relief. So Christmas is dominated by the unloading effort, working around the clock to get the supplies ready um, and off the ship for the next year. Uh, Midwinter's Day, June 21st, is therefore the biggest celebration in Antarctica. And it's also more important because it's in the middle of winter when people really need something to keep them going. There are huge meals, time off for everyone except the chef, uh, and the station members make each other winter gifts. And while that giving of gifts is obviously great all by itself, who doesn't love a present? Uh, the fact that they are made by hand has served a double purpose of giving people something to focus on through that first half of the Antarctic winter. And some of my favourite Halley stories are from the, the slightly mad things that people get up to in the winter to stay happy and keep the team together. My favourite stories include the year that someone accidentally ordered an order of magnitude too much Weetabix, so got creative doing things like making mazes out of Weetabix boxes. There was also the time that they all dressed up as Rocky Horror Show characters and then had an unexpected fire drill, still dressed in fishnets and corsets. Uh, films, games, freezing barbecues, photography shows, nights at the bar have all been important aspects of team building and well-being at Halley throughout history. Uh, on a more sombre note, I think it's important to just touch on kind of why they bother doing all these things other than that they're fun. Um, Halley isn't fun and easy for everyone. 24-hour sunlight and 24-hour darkness are both difficult for people to deal with, and Halley is extremely isolated in winter. After COVID, I think we maybe all have a bit more understanding of what it means to be stuck inside with the same people for months at a time, but I personally can't imagine doing it without sunlight, daily walks, Netflix, or a bit of privacy from 10 or so people that I might not necessarily choose to spend that much time with normally. Things as small as how someone walks or chews their cereal can really flare up in those kind of situations. And also, and I'll, I'll leave this topic to in Daniela's capable hands, but Halley has not always been the most inclusive of places. Women weren't allowed to winter at Halley until 1996, and Halley was the last British station that women were allowed to winter at. Today, there are large numbers of women working in polar science, but the issue of gender in Antarctica is very much not set to rest. Increasingly, researchers are engaging with issues of gender equality in Antarctica and some of the serious problems that remain to be addressed. And that's just one part of the question of inclusive polar research. Issues such as disability, racial equality and LGBT plus Antarcticans are outside of my personal area of expertise, but vital questions that we as a community have to grapple with when it comes to working out who Antarctic science is done by and who Antarctica is for. But to end on a lighter note, uh, I thought I'd just share this little snippet from Base Magazine, the Halley Comet from the IGY years, to show that you could also go too far the other way. Life in Antarctica is not quite as bad as people like Scott and Oates had it, and that is thanks to an awful lot of hard work by doctors, engineers, and so on. And I'll just, I'll just read out this quote quickly. Uh, After many years of effort, the BBC and the NPA have at last convinced the great British public of the absolute hell of life in the polar regions. They hope you will cooperate in maintaining this myth and to see your reports speak of frostbite and starvation, of primeval blizzards and intolerable cold. No mention shall be made of the great advances our doctors, engineers and physicists have made, which enable one to regard the Antarctic as just somewhere else to live. So that's your whistle stop tour of a piece of polar history. I hope I've shown you that Halley, its science and its people are worth paying attention to. And I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you.
Wonderful, Alice, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, they fascinate. Uh, my mind is boggling at the Weetabix maze, I have to say. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I totally agree. I think uh, maintaining the and sustaining the um, the myth of the uh, terrible nature of the polar regions and don't give it away but the, how beautiful and wonderful they are, <laughs> I think is, is quite true. So Alice, thank you so, so much. We look forward to um, interrogating you still further shortly. So um, we've had some great responses um uh, in the chat um i've got some interesting places that people have come from so we've seen we've got some people from italy we've got somebody from spain from paris and even the isles of Scilly. so that's uh, it's great to see uh, any any advance on that i say so please keep keep it coming in the chat and let us know where, where you're coming from we want to see the farthest north farthest east farthest west and the farthest south if we can okay next up we've got uh dr daniela mc McKay from Texas Tech University, so possibly our farthest flung uh, contributor, who amongst many things uh, studies the early science programs in Antarctica and has for us tonight some revealing insights into how culture, organisational culture, science and policy has shaped Antarctic science. So uh, Daniela, we're looking for, very much looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to tell us, so over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm really delighted to be here with uh, these other great scholars. And um, before I get started, I also want to acknowledge the work of Morgan Sieg, um, who this type of research that I'm doing really draws upon. Um, okay. Uh, Antarctica is often characterized as a man's world uh, for men who display classic signs of masculinity, like physical strength, uh, courage, and fortitude. This was especially true a century ago, but it's remained true, even though much of the physical requirements of doing work in Antarctica have gone away, leaving aside any discussions of the validity of women and their ability to cope in the outdoors. While women have been working in Antarctica for many years now, there's still a popular perception that the traditionally masculine traits of physical courage and manly exertion are necessary to travel there. But the reason for the historic exclusion of women from the British Antarctic was never really based on actual concerns that they wouldn't be able to do the work. But instead, the general argument was that women would serve as a distraction and disrupt the culture required to form good bonds between men, um, the bonds required to conduct safe and productive research. So it wasn't that women couldn't do this work in Antarctica. It was that their presence would put a damper on the ability of men to bond and by extension, do good work. An example of this attitude came from uh, Vivian Fuchs, the longtime director of the British Antarctic Survey, who did a lot to shape the institutional policy and culture at the survey. Um, Fuchs even wrote that, I have steadfastly opposed the inclusion of women in an Antarctic team as liable to cause more trouble than they are worth. And should it happen that one day women are included as part of the base complement, problems will certainly arise and lead to the breakdown of that sense of unity which is so important to the group. He went on to admit that this does not mean that women could not compete with the environment. They certainly could, but it might be wise for them to form single sex communities where they could form the same bonds as their male counterparts. Before I started this specific project, I was aware of Fuchs's uh, thoughts on this issue, but I wasn't very interested in it. Uh, my PhD thesis was about geophysics, um, but I kept finding evidence of what I thought entailed the male bonds that the presence of women might disrupt. For instance, um, I was reading an ornithological paper from 1966, a pretty standard report on nesting grounds in the British Antarctic Survey archives. And uh, clipped to the back of this report was a photograph of a nude woman, and I cropped it, of course. Um, and uh, the caption was species unknown. So punning on the word bird to describe a woman, somebody wrote on the back of this photo, probably a blue tick. Um, how, I wondered, did that photo get pinned to a scientific report um, produced by the government and stay on it all the way up to its point of it being filed in the archives? Nobody thought that this was inappropriate. Or I'd be reading the oral history of a meteorologist that mentioned all of the photographs of nude women pasted over the walls, not like embarrassingly dragged out of him by an interview, but um, a fond memory, a funny story. Or I was looking at the accounts of, of, I was looking for an account of the eruption of Deception Island and the Bass Archive catalog indicated to me that there might be an account from a base magazine produced that year at Faraday. And there was indeed an account of the eruption in there, 
between several cutouts of nude women and profiles of men writing about their fantasies of raping underage virgins, for one extreme example. So I wondered, is this the culture that Bass was worried that the women would interrupt? So I decided to take a closer look at these magazines produced on base, which I believe reflect the cultural norms and values uh, codified in written and visual mediums to show how the objectification of women in spaces like base magazines and on pinups in the walls and stuff like that serve to make Antarctic research stations unfit for women, um, keeping multiple generations of scientists from working there and making a legacy that continues today. Print culture has a long history in the Antarctic. Um, many polar enthusiasts will kind of expound at length about the beauty of the South Polar Times or the Aurora Australis. And moreover, using images of women for male bonding has a long history in the Antarctic. Um, in his account of the Belgica expedition, Frederick Cook wrote about a beauty contest where women from magazines were ranked according to several attributes and then voted on for who would make a good wife and who would be especially attractive to what Cook called the wandering willies of the group. Some base magazines maintain charming aspects um, that Alice showed, uh, including things like poetry, short stories, uh, crossword puzzles, and art, but they also consistently maintained um, this objectification of women. So here's some very pretty covers, but from, um, and these two, in fact, don't actually really have any sexual content on the inside, but um, from the 1950s forward, many base magazines were dominated by sexual content, including many nude images of women. Um, the pictures of the women by themselves, which were mostly clipped from Mayfair or Playboy, honestly were nothing really super shocking, even for me, and I'm a former Catholic schoolgirl. Um, and the fact that these sort of magazines were popular is also not very interesting to me. But what I found more interesting were two things. First, this wasn't just the consumption of semi-pornographic material by guys that, who were bored living uh, far away from home. By cutting out, uh, clipping out these pictures and adding captions or writing short stories and jokes to accompany these images, or even um, pasting photographs of base members into the magazines themselves. Um, and you can see an example of this. Uh, this isn't actually from a base magazine. It's from um, the Transantarctic Expedition, and it was hung on the wall at Shackleton Base. Um, but doing all of these things created a culture where the bonding and community experience of these men were predicated on objectifying and sexualizing women all in a period when women were not allowed to go there themselves. Um, and the caption for this image, which is from a book that was published in 2013, involves the phrase, coming to grips with a model. The second interesting thing to me was the fact that rather than getting more toned down, uh, phasing this type of material out as workplace sexism was becoming more publicly unacceptable and women were becoming more integrated in the workplace generally, on average, this material became more violent and sexually explicit the closer that the British Antarctic Survey got to full gender integration in 1996. Because I want to keep this presentation PG-13, I'm not going to show you really any of the content of these magazines. But beyond um, nude women, um, there are a lot of jokes and fantasies, um, agony ant columns and what have you about uh, rape, uh, sex with underage girls, prostitution, um, including a set of Spanish lessons for engaging in um, paid sex in Latin America on your way down or back from the ice. And the men were generally aware that they could say whatever they wanted in these magazines, as long as they didn't seriously challenge Bass policies. For instance, in 1965, the Halley Comet had a critique um, of the British Antarctic policy, and uh, the men were censured for this critique and their magazines were all confiscated. But as far as sexual content, it seems as anything went. Um, as one base member wrote in a 1972 magazine, I have only one comment to make about the vituperation, filth, pornography, lies, libel, scandal, and slander, and other sordid and unprintable material which you have the turpitude to publish in your journal. Give us some more of it. Signed, disgusted, but not yet quite disgusted enough. So when researching this piece, it was very clear that much of the content of these magazines, particularly when it came to sexual material was intended for like shock value to be 
as irreverent as possible for comedic effect. Um, and there are actually self-aware comments scattered through the magazines where the men acknowledge um, their the inappropriateness of the magazine, like talking about how they would be embarrassed if their girlfriend or mother found it. Um, in 1982, one man wrote an extended piece arguing that in many ways, Halley can be called the last refuge of male chauvinism on this planet. But a closer look shows that the fair sex is one of the subjects which occupies our minds more than anything else. The author then uh, talks sort of movingly about emotional bonds that relationships with women bring. But he ends the essay um, with a section on Brazilian sex workers and um, men who've decided to swap their sisters. The poor girls do not know it yet, but they've been traded away in a manner which should have died out after the American Civil War. Apparently living in Halley brings out the savage in us. Another kind of very self-aware um, example of the you know, inappropriateness of this sort of material is uh, from a definition of women from uh, Signe in 1980. Uh, women, extremely dangerous species when south, all bases should be protected from all but the barest minimum contact with them, even thinking of them that reduced the quality of the science conducted Ongoing research into the compatibility of sexes here at HQ is, of course, perfectly safe and productive. But then, after apparently kind of pointing out the hypocrisy of excluding women from the Antarctic, the same issue contains um, a film review of the uh, movie uh, Debbie, Debbie Does Dallas and a piece explaining that uh, women are only a figment of the imagination and made in two dimensions on the glossy paper of Mayfair penthouses and cosmopolitans. But for the most part, these magazines were meant to be semi-private. They were a mark of bonding uh, filled with in-jokes for the men stationed there each year. As Alice already noted, uh, being stationed at an Antarctic base like Halley or Signy um, is extremely boring. Uh, these magazines allowed men to perform at masculinity, even if they weren't actually performing feats of heroism. Therefore, these spaces would still be constructed as masculine and unfit for women, rendering any discussion of women's physical capabilities in uh, such an environment moot. So why would they all do this? Uh, why would they want to exclude women in this way? Uh, most evidence, I think, has to do with the idea that women going to Antarctica would diminish its status as a special place. Once you have women, you no longer have a frontier. Um, women kind of wreck the idea that you need to be some kind of rugged hero to spend time there. And in the United Kingdom, this was even sketched into law. Uh, the Sex Discrimination Act of 1973 prescribed sex discrimination, but exceptions were made for overseas territory, including Antarctica. And there were real consequences to this. First and foremost, it kept generations of talented women from contributing their work. Janet Thompson, the first uh, British woman scientist, a geologist to work in Antarctica, was recruited to her postgraduate program deliberately because her advisor disliked that all of the male students would interrupt their work by going to Antarctica and she would not be allowed to. But also, once women did start going to Antarctica, this culture didn't go away. The first year that women wintered at Halley in 1996, um, they too filled out a survey for the magazine that had questions about masturbation, their thoughts on homosexual sex, and their sexual fantasies. Um, and there are regular reports coming out of Antarctica about the problems with sexual harassment and assault that still contribute to the unevenness of the sexes in, in the Antarctic. So, as I said at the start, I didn't ever really mean to start doing this research. I'm notoriously in, uninterested among my group of colleagues in gender history but I found that it's literally not possible to research or understand the history of Antarctic science without being aware that it was predicated on the simultaneous exclusion and sexualized objectification of women. Thank you so much. Daniela, thank you very much. Sobering stuff, I think. And, and it, it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear um, the history of this um, and how how much has changed and yet how in some ways how little so I look, we look forward to a, you know more of a discussion um later on but uh, for now then thank you so so much for um for your presentation and finally we have henrietta hammond from the university of reading who will um who's going to re-examine with us the legacies of possibly the two most british of antarctic explorers captain robert falcon scott and sir ernest shackleton 
whose experiences have left an indelible impact during the century since their, their efforts um, in the last century. So we look forward to hearing a bit more about, uh, about those two from you, Henrietta, over to you. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Camilla, and hello, everybody. It's, it's great to be here with you this evening. Um, yes, my name is Henrietta Hammett, and I am a PhD candidate at the University of Reading. And probably the most important thing I think that you need to know about me for this talk is that I am a museum anthropologist. And basically what that scary title means is that I'm interested in museums and all of the people in them. So whether that's visitors to museums, volunteers, professionals who work there, or indeed the people that we can find in museum collections, the people on display, if you like. And this is something that I'm going to come back to later on, but this is quite a whistle stop tour this evening. So um, as I've not got a lot of time, I'm going to jump straight in. Now, I wonder what comes to mind when you hear the word hero. I think for most people, we probably think about a very certain set of characteristics. Usually we're thinking about a man. Usually he's probably white, he's probably of European or American descent, and he's usually working on his own to overcome some great evil, some terrible power. Um, and this is something that I like to call the archetypal hero, the archetypal definition of a hero. And we in our society in the West think of this archetypal hero as kind of the only definition of a hero, but actually it's really specific and it's based uh, on ancient Greek thinking, ancient Greek thinking about the ideal male warrior. And I have a bit of a problem, as you might have guessed, with this definition of a hero, because it just doesn't take into account that people's heroic status can change over time. Now, I argue that Rather than having specific characteristics, heroes come into being when a person aligns with the values of the society which is viewing them. So not necessarily even the society that they're coming from, but the society that is viewing them. And of course, these values are open to change. Just think about the NHS heroes of the pandemic. I'm sure pre-pandemic, you might have heard of medical professionals being described as heroes, but it certainly wasn't the trope that it has become today. And that's because as a society, we've seen this enormous shift and our values have changed. What we look for in heroes has changed. So this contextual definition of a hero doesn't discount our archetypal heroes by any means, but it broadens the net so that more individuals can be understood as heroic. And to test this, I'd like to look at two heroes from the aptly named Heroic Age of Antarctica Exploration. And they are, perhaps unsurprisingly to most of you, Captain Robert Falcon Scott and Sir Ernest Shackleton. We will see that as time has passed, so has the way we've seen these two men. Now, Captain Robert Falcon Scott is perhaps most famous for his 1910 to 1913 British Antarctic Expedition, also known as the Terra Nova after the ship. And Scott set off with the backing of the Royal Geographical Society and the hopes of the nation behind him that he would reach the South Pole. In many ways, he cut a heroic figure off to battle the elements and hopefully return home with a grand prize. The claim to be the first man ever to reach the South Pole and to do it in the name of Britain. But interestingly, whether the expedition was actually primarily about science or primarily about exploration was never officially decided. Now, Scott reached the pole, sadly, only to realise that he had been beaten by just five weeks by the Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen. And unfortunately, for a number of reasons, which I'm not going to go into here today, although I'm sure there are plenty of people who uh, you could speak to, in, even in the comments, who could give you a fair idea of this, uh, he and his men did die on their return journey. So you'd think that he'd lose some of his heroism, but actually he was really positively perceived. And I think that's in large part due to his message to the public, his kind of final official letter um, to the people of Great Britain in which he talked about the courage and the hardihood and the endurance of his men. Um, so Scott had made himself something of a martyr to the cause of Britain's greatness and with that, a hero. But slowly things began to change. Years passed and Scott's leadership style was called into question as new trends saw a more egalitarian approach with men leading from the front rather than being bound by rank as Scott was. 
In the 1950s and 60s, new ideas about masculinity and emotional expressiveness also began to wear the shine of Scots heroism. And as the British Empire began to be dismantled, Scots' expansionist role in trying to capture the pole for Great Britain became less alluring to the public. Society was changing, and so was the way that we saw Captain Scott. We're going to leave Scott's star now on the wane and go back in time again to 1914 and a link up with Sir Ernest Shackleton. Now, Shackleton's 19. 19- 14 to 1917 Imperial Transantarctic Expedition or Endurance Expedition saw him achieve one of the most impressive feats in maritime history. Oh, sorry, that's my Scott slide that I've completely missed. Here we are, Shackleton. When the ship Endurance was crushed by sea ice and sank, he led his crew to the remote Elephant Island on a small flotilla of lifeboats. And from there, he set off on a punishing 800 mile voyage to South Georgia to fetch help and save his men. This is undoubtedly an impressive story. And while it was considered so at the time, it also took place right in the middle of the First World War. And the public was less impressed by the daring do of explorers because they were facing their own trials. Almost every family could now tell a story of bravery from much closer to home. And Shackleton remained something of an underdog in heroic terms until years after his death, when he began to experience the opposite of Scott, a kind of late resurgence. The 1990s saw a phenomenon that the academic Rebecca Farley has described as Shackleton mania, when a series of attempts to replicate Shackleton's perilous journeys took place just as the media was decrying a loss of masculinity in the modern world. These events created a perfect storm, which raised Shackleton's status to a true hero once again. Back in the present, I would argue that our new interest in climate science is also shaping how we view these men. I'm increasingly asked how these explorers' early scientific work might link to climate change. And it's true that much of the meteorological and oceanographic work performed by Scotts and Shackleton's crews has provided a historic baseline for climate scientists to work from. But I think our thirst for showing their relevance in this field today is more indicative indicative of the fact that what we want from Scotts and from Shackleton is constantly changing as is what we see in them as they move in and out of their heroic status over time. And this is because our values as a society are changing, impacting directly on what we consider to be heroic behaviour. So just in the final minutes of my presentation now, let me bring this back to my own interest in museums with one museum which is very close to my heart and I'm sure is easily recognisable for a lot of you. It's the Polar Museum at the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge and this is where I worked until I started my PhD last year. Now this research institute was founded with money raised from a national outpouring of grief after the death of Captain Scott and it was designed to be both a memorial to Scott and the men who died with him on their return from the South Pole, as well as a scientific base for data gathered in the polar regions to be processed and understood. Indeed, it's still a serious academic institution based on polar science today, with records dating back to these very early expeditions, which are now able to be referenced by contemporary researchers. And an important part of the scientific mission of the Institute was the building of a museum to be used for teaching new polar explorers using past technologies. And it's still around today. So the very foundation of the polar, foundations of the Polar Museum are based on a very specific view of history, which is concerned with memorialising Scott and his accomplishments. It's thinking about him as an archetypal hero on his own against the perils of the natural world, trying to overcome them and capture the pole. But unlike how we imagine archetypal heroes, there were so many more people involved in getting these explorers to the Antarctic. And we can see them if we just look carefully at some of these displays. The best example of this, I think, is Captain Oates's sleeping bag. And this is the sleeping bag that Oates had been using during his journey with Scott to the South Pole. And it is the one he left behind when he perished. It's made from reindeer fur, which requires very specific knowledge in order for it to be harvested at the right time of year for it to have the best insulating qualities. And this knowledge would have come from northern Arctic indigenous groups like the Sami reindeer herders of northern Norway. Without the Sami's intimate understanding of their world, technologies like this would have been far less effective for our polar explorers. And this sleeping bag and many other objects belonging to heroic age Antarctic explorers, including Inuit style snow goggles and Sami style finesco boots, can be used to tell stories about different kinds of people who aren't usually included in the historical record. 
Even in one expedition to the Antarctic, we can identify a network of humans and objects which connects the world literally from pole to pole. For me, finding this diverse network is perhaps the most exciting part of studying the people in museums. Because if, as we have seen, we can change our minds about what makes someone heroic, then maybe we can expand our definition of heroism. By doing that, we can gain a deeper and more nuanced understanding of these heroic expeditions and all the people who made them possible, not just Scott and Shackleton. Thank you very much for listening. Henrietta, thank you very, very much. That was uh, tremendous and uh, a really refreshing insight into you know such familiar figures to us all, I think, those who are interested in Antarctica and the polar regions. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to move on to questions in a moment. But before we do that, I'm going to give you the results of our uh, ge geography competition. So it looks like the far farthest north listener is in West Lothian. I'm happy to take a, 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 another um, bid on that, if you like. But West Lothian in Scotland, um, we have farthest south, we have Brazil, which is, a, I, feel, I think, a worthy winner, worthy winner of our of our farthest flung listener. And then uh, looking um, east and west, uh, Houston, Texas, looks like it's uh, taking taking the farthest west. And then we have a bit of a tie here with Berlin and Italy. So depending on where you are in Italy, or, um, we, are, we are looking over there into Central Europe. So great to see so many people joining us uh, this evening and, and so, from such diverse places. So it's wonderful to, to have you join us tonight. So we're going to move on to um, the q and It's having an interesting section. We've had some fantastic um, speak, uh, uh, speakers this evening, like Alice, uh, Daniela and Henrietta, thank you again. Um, I think really fascinating, and I think there's definitely some threads between each of your each of your talks, which I think we can explore this evening. So I'm going to um, take some of these questions. We thank you so much, everybody who's posted some questions so far into the comments. Please keep them coming. We're, you know, we've we've got a, we've got some time together. So I'd love to um, kick off with a couple of questions. So um, I'm just looking for the first one. Here we go. Ooh, here we go. Should be one coming up on the screen. Yeah. Okay. You want me to I'll just jump in with that one as it's a Hallie question? Uh, yeah. Great question. Thank you for this one. Um, Hallie's location is definitely special. Uh, it's been special since the beginning, and it's special today. And so I guess there's there's two there's two answers to this question. One is why was it there in the first place in a difficult to access place? And then one question is why is it still there? in a difficult to access and currently crumbling <laughs> location. Um, so part of it is um, that it's, you know, there's, as I've talked about this, it's important to have a network of, of stations and observatories for geophysical research. And that doesn't mean just Antarctica, it means, you know, the whole world. And Halley, where it is now, it was kind of a gap in the IGY coverage. And it's an important place for geophysical research because of things like its position um, relative to the magnetic field of the Earth, it's a really good place for doing research like the kind of the space weather research that I, I talked about in my presentation. Um, also, because of various factors, you know, it's been described to me as kind of the closest thing you can get to a controlled experiment in the field, which physicists love, but often can't find on Earth. Um, due to things like the magnetic field location and um, you know the diurnal variation not not being there for so much of the winter uh, there's also in terms of you know why it's still there because it is you know it's it's still hard to access today and the ice shelf is crumbling and that's not great and all of that but part of why it's still there is that the continuous record is really important and we've been collecting this data since 1956 and it, it's just it's scientifically very valuable to continue in that location and keep gathering that data um, and that has led to some kind of big advances in the automation of science um, in Antarctica during the winter period as a result of the crack in the ice shelf. Great thank you very much and Gwyn thank you very much for your question there. Okay I'm ready for the next one. I'm waiting for it to come up on the screen. Just looking for that next question. Is there one? Okay. 
here we go. So a question here from Sue. So it sounds like a bit uh, like some of the problems faced by the Mercury 13 in the early years of the US space pr program. Are you able to comment on that? Yeah, um, I mean, that's a really good observation. Um, this isn't a, a unique situation. It's not unique either to um, the United Kingdom and it's not unique to um, uh, Antarctica. Um, I when I was doing research, I, I found several um, people who have written about this similar situations of women in outer space programs, in the military, firefighters, um, various geographers have written about the, the same type of, um, I guess, structural um, limitations and everything. Any kind of these sort of extreme geographies where like normal rules of society don't seem to apply. Um, in these sort of like all male situations, but more to the point, yes, this is also an American problem. Um, I was just last night um, e emailing with um, a retired um, uh, ecologist, a uh, gentleman who was um, at McMurdo in the 1960s, and he was talking to me about how like uh, the the U.S. Navy ships wouldn't even carry the women to Antarctica, and they talked about like how if they brought women there, they would they would just get raped or they would just have sex with everyone. Um, and I could give you examples of this from New Zealand. Um, Australia had uh, the Sistine uh, ceiling, um, the Carpenter's Hut at Mawson, which until 2005, when it was destroyed by vandals, um, it just was papered over completely with uh, new pictures of women. And um, uh, women were fully integrated in, in Australia's program since the 1980s. So they had they went to Antarctica and got to go to the Carpenter's Hut that was completely covered with new pictures of women. Um, so, yeah, this is a problem that you can see in a lot of different times and places. Absolutely. Yeah. Daniel, thank you. I mean, fascinating stuff. I think it's, um, I mean, certainly when we look after huts in the Antarctic and of course, Port Lockroy has the famous painted ladies on the wall, which are, you know, hand painted depictions of women um, uh, adorning the walls of the, of the building. So these are throughout, aren't they, the, the buildings? Okay, I've got a question here for Henrietta. So was Shackleton warm in his sleeping bag and would he have been fully dressed? That's a fantastic question. Um, thanks very much for that, David. I think, I well, I wonder whether our idea of what warm is might change um, somewhat <laughs> between now and, and Shackleton's time. Um, certainly, it, it kept them warmer than uh, other types of technology would have done. And obviously reindeer uh, skin was really tried and tested and it had been used for thousands of years in the Arctic beforehand. It's quite nice because there's a little bit of, um, especially in the Terra Nova, there's a little bit of kind of argument between the men about whether you should have your sleeping bag reindeer side for in or reindeer fur out. And that's kind of, it, it's a bit of a like personal, like, no, no, it's better to have it in, it's better to have it out kind of uh, argument that they were having on, on a day to day. So I think from that, you get the impression that they maybe weren't as warm as they would have liked to have been. <laughs> um, in terms of being fully dressed, again, I think that is probably dependent on uh, exactly what they have been doing during the day and and what time of year it was and uh, I don't think they had their Antarctic pajamas by any means but I think yeah whether or not you were going to be wearing your full um, you know mitts and, and everything else is again it's a little bit dependent on uh, exactly what you were doing and and where you were so um, the worst journey in the world, which um, is something that happened during the uh, Terra Nova expedition. It was kind of a side a side quest, if you like, to go and find some emperor penguin eggs. And during that uh, expedition, the men there famously had this terrible night where um, they had to, they built a little stone cairn and there was a terrible storm and they had to hunker down into their sleeping bags with literally as much as they could save to stop it from all blowing away in the storm and they got covered in snow. And so in that situation, yes, I think probably they would have been wearing <laughs> as much as they could. Uh, but whether or not that was something that happened day to day in the tents is yeah, it's an interesting question. I'll have to have to read up a bit more about that, I think. I think the public need to know. Is, is there not yeah. um, a famous poem that was written about the inside, outside, inside, outside sleeping bags? Is it Herbert Ponting, perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> they really had their ideas and they stuck to them. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Okay, uh, there's a question here for um, Alice. Um, it would be very interesting to know whether global science was being made during the Cold War period. Thank you. Yeah, another good, good question. I'm kind of interpreting this as 
whether there was kind of science being done from around the world and maybe kind of that international collaborative element that I talked about. Um, and the answer is yes. And that's one of the things that makes Antarctica so interesting is that, you know, you, you have during the IGY, the US and the Soviet Union within this, you know, the, the same scientific enterprise. And then they signed the Antarctic Treaty together as well. And I, that's something that people still talk about today. And, you know, some of the, the people that I interviewed who've been at Halley, they very much talk about the kind of the, the similarities they shared with people at uh, stations from other 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 nations rather than the kind of the differences and the the geopolitical conflicts and so on um and i think that that's just one of the the reasons that politically speaking antarctica is just such a unique and interesting place because we have been able to find space for collaboration um you know since the igy throughout any number of complicated geopolitical situations <laughs> I think that's right, and it, it, science and science seems to transcend some of these other geopolitical problems that uh, we encounter elsewhere sometimes, isn't it? Thank you. Um, and another question from Gwyn here. Have you contrasted the attitudes to and the experiences of women on the ships of the British Antarctic Survey compared to the Antarctic expeditions during this time? That's one for Daniela. Um, that's a good question. I have not personally, like the, the, in terms of specifically looking at these um, magazines and everything, I specifically looked at Halley and Signy, um, although I have seen other ones as well. Um, I haven't done research really on the experience on the ships, but I do know that I can tell you that um, not just in the case of the United Kingdom, um, just generally women um, were allowed on ships, um, women scientists were allowed on ships much earlier than they were allowed actually on the continent. Uh, Janet Thompson, who I talked about in my talk, um, she went to the British Antarctic in the early 1980s and she was aboard a ship and, and, and slept aboard the ship. She wasn't allowed to sleep um, at the stations. Um, so, and then of course you have, um, American um, and Soviet uh, oceanographers who are, or um, ocean, like marine biologists who are um, on ships in the Antarctic before they're actually going to stations or they're going in, in like the sort of inland field. But um, I actually don't know really an answer to the question about what their experiences were like, because I just haven't done that research, um, other than to say that they were allowed there earlier. Mm, sure. So I can I follow up that one slightly? I mean, it just so the cultures on the ships and the bases may be may have been slightly different. But what about internationally? Was this a peculiarly British problem, or was it is it, or British a way of doing things, or is it something you you've seen in other other national programs? You mean like in terms of the this type of um, uh, I don't know, uh, in, like sort of institutionalized communal uh, sexism yeah. stuff? Um, oh, yeah. I, I see this in in, 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 yeah. every, in yes, I see this in every national. Antarctic program that I've looked at. Um, and I, I've only really looked at uh, American, British, Australian, and New Zealand ones. But um, yes, it, it's thing. pretty much, but, but, the, but on ships specifically, I can't necessarily tell you the answer to that because I, yeah, I don't know if there's like specific differences um, at this time without um, going and doing a little bit more research on that. Sure. Great, thank you. Note to self. Mm -hmm. So another question here for um, Henrietta. So a great talk. Um, I think that museums provide evidence that documents that documents and journal articles does not capture. Do you think in this sense that history and anthropology can build a greater narrative? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot in there. Um, I definitely agree with you that I think museum, I mean, obviously museums are also often homes to documents and journals and that sort of thing. I think if we're talking just about museum objects, and by that I mean um, the things that, the things, the things that were taken to expeditions, the things that belong to people, the things that came home with them um, that you can't necessarily read, uh, they're, they're the, yeah, they're the equipment and, and the personal belongings, then I definitely think there are lots of things that we can find from careful looking at those objects. And that's something that I feel really strongly about, that actually there's a lot of information to be found in an object on its own and understanding kind of use patterns and where's it been, where's it worn away or what markings has it got on it and how has this been used day to day by people? I think it can give you a really 
personal view of history in a way that sometimes doesn't get recorded in documents and, and journals because, well, that's just those are just my boots. Why would I tell you about them? Um, so I definitely think it, it gives you a it gives you that kind of personal insight into history. Um, whether history and anthropology can build a greater narrative, I think like that will be great. Um, something to bear in mind um, in this sense as well is that museums aren't neutral spaces and they're still very much, you, you know, they're still very much uh, interpreted by curators and um, learning specialists and, and different people in museums have an impact on exactly what you're finding out about, exactly what you're seeing, what's written in the text, in exhibitions, what's explained to you in talks like this one. Um, and so I think it is important to understand that even museum displays are still part of this kind of ongoing production of people as heroes or, or people as, you know, kind of side characters. And so it is very much a it's still a contextual thing, if you see what I mean, that museums are still uh, interpreting within a very specific context that is their own. And so, yes, I think there's opportunity for greater narrative, but uh, yeah, uh, we need to be aware of the context that we're working in as well. Thank you very much. As a, a, a time served museum person, I'd quite agree. I think objects have a lot to tell us. And uh, as I say, it's that human connection with those that I think can tell amazing stories. Okay, another a question here for Alice. Any idea when people will be able to overwinter again in Halley? It's been it's 2017, I think you said that last time we yes. were overwintered. Yes, and I think I think that's a question that um, a lot of people are very interested in. Um, and uh, I'm not I don't think that we necessarily have an answer yet. Um, the, the ice shelf kind of the cracking that's happening at the moment is just this kind of it's, it's part of its natural kind of life cycle. Um, and it's it's quite hard to know, you know, when when we might see a major carving event and then how long it might take for the ice shelf to stabilize follow, following a carving event. There has been kind of a, a, a small carving recently. I don't know if some of you may have sort of seen that that iceberg being tracked away from the Brunt ice shelf. Um, but there's there's kind of the, the cracks that are preventing um, wintering a, a, a much bigger, much bigger issue. Halley 6 is, you know, the, the station is safe, but it's, an, it's a question of how safe it is for people to be there in the winter when you can't get to them to help them in, 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 if there's a problem. And as I said, it, it's been, it's really pushed forward um, the automation of science in Antarctica, which I think raises some really interesting questions about, you know, doing Antarctic science on the ground, um, given issues like climate change and having as little impact on the continent as we possibly can. Um, so by the time that, that the ice shelf stabilizes, it'll be interesting to see how far we've got with that automation of science and how those kind of narratives about how we do Antarctic science have, have changed. Thank you. This is this the first time that there have have not been overwinters at Halley in its his, in its total history. Yes. Yep. Twenty seventeen was was the first ever time. Um, which obviously that kind of that continuous data collection is it was a huge problem. Um, and you know you've got to take your hats off to the the bath scientists who managed to put that automation in place as, as fast as they did. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kat, for that question. And so Maribel has a question. Henrietta, did the way people saw Amundsen impact what they thought about Scott? Oh, yeah, there's a big question. Uh, thank you for that, Maribel. Um, I definitely think so. Something that I didn't really have uh, a minute to tell you about in this talk was that um, actually Amundsen and Scott and their race to the pole was a surprise um, in that Amundsen set off for the Antarctic but told everyone that he was going to the Arctic and even his crew didn't realise that they were going to the Antarctic until they'd already set sail and then he said by the way guys <laughs> we're going south it's a slightly longer journey um, and so that in combination with the fact that he used skis and dogs and technologies that really worked in the polar landscape meant that he was very much kind of in and out of the pole um, which at the time was amazing I mean it's still amazing now it it just didn't seem like it was so much of a big deal for Amundsen like he had all of this polar experience and he just got on with it and it was great and I think in the UK that really did have an impact on how people saw him because they had had this martyr in Scott to the kind of UK's um 
not imperial expansion, but certainly the UK's greatness in trying to reach the pole. And he had, you know, really struggled on and he'd walked and he had used skis and he was a bit of a son of the Industrial Revolution. So he'd taken some motor sledges that didn't really work. But, you know, he was doing things by the book and really struggling for them. And I think there was a bit of a feeling that Hopkinson wasn't really being a gent because he had such an easy time of it. And so I do think that it was easy then to see Scott as the hero to Amundsen's anti-hero villain character um, because he had, you know, just made it look easy. Indeed, indeed. I think that's uh, it's really interesting, isn't it, how how perspectives do change and are there players coming into things that can affect one's perspective? So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thanks, Mary for the question. Uh, Floor has a question. How can we work on making Antarctica more inclusive in the future? This is for Daniela, but maybe the other two may have a perspective on this too. So, Daniela. Um, so, I mean, this isn't necessary. this isn't really my area of expertise um, in terms of like how to make things <laughs> more inclusive and better or whatever. I think that there's been a lot of progress so far, um, you know, having, uh, for example, uh, Jane Francis is the director of FAST and um, having more women, I think FAST is about 30% uh, um, uh, women now. Um, when I first uh, I was basing that when I first started this project, I was basing it on numbers from 2014, and I think it was 27 then. So I think it's about, someone told me it was about 30 now. Um, so having greater um, like numbers of women in Antarctica obviously is gonna help. Um, but I suppose also uh, recognizing this sort of past, I think is a way to, to help with the inclusivity um, because I often have people respond to my work um, or, you know, when I bring up this issue being like, well, that's the past. Let's like talk about the now and the, you know, and everything like that stuff doesn't matter. And it's like, well, I mean, it, it does matter. And it's one of the things that like contributes to these kind of cultures that are hostile. So I think acknowledging and being aware of this kind of uh, sort of structural past is important. Um, like I said, I wasn't even planning on doing this research. I was totally all about like, let's talk about geophysics. But when I'm reading and it's just like, all of this material kind of jumps out at you. It's like, wow, like, how can you possibly even talk about the science, the greatness of Bass without also talking about this other thing. So I think this kind of acknowledgement is important. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's um, I'm, I'm mindful that we're four women on the screen. So the <laughs> Polar Regions Antarctica has attracted all of us to to work work in it. I mean, I mean Alice, do you have a, a perspective on this? I mean, a, a, maybe a personal perspective or something you've seen when you're, in your research about how we could make Antarctica more inclusive? Well, I think the only thing I'd like to say is that the, the way that polar research is becoming more inclusive is through an awful lot of hard work by people, not me, but other people. Um, and, you know, people doing things like Polar Pride and um, Minorities in Polar Research. And those are both Twitter accounts that I would really encourage everyone to go and have a look at, who just kind of are really pushing the fact that Antarctic science is not inclusive enough and that there are, you know, there are people that we don't, aren't, necessarily as visible as the kind of the white explorer type within polar science um, and there's there's an awful lot more to be done but I think thanks to some really dedicated people change is kind of slowly slowly happening. Thank you and Henrietta I mean definitely no women involved in the heroic era of course um, but again I mean you, you might have a perspective on inclusion or perhaps the the use of the stories of heroic era to attract a more diverse audience and more diverse participants in the polar regions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I completely understand this this feeling that that the heroic era was kind of a time where it was the Antarctic was like this a apolitical, like undiverse space, and it was just white men going and and obviously they were the only people there. But I don't think that that means that they were the only people involved. And there are a lot of you know, Shackleton had female sponsors and um, even just on a really personal level there were women making sledging flags to send away with men on expeditions to give them a feeling of home and I, I think those stories are there if we look for them but we've got so used to saying okay well these are our heroic blokes in our museums or wherever that we we've sort of given ourselves an out and and I think that 
that's that's worse for everybody. We should be re-imbuing these these stories with the things that actually did happen, so that people know that there women there were women there. Women existed in the heroic age, um, and just yeah, filtering them back in, I think, to our stories is the thing to do. I think that's right. I think there's, there's some great initiatives I think out there that are trying to, you know, us at the UKHC, of course, that you know we're trying to profile some stories that are telling those more hidden stories. And that, again, of course, is what this event is all about. Let's scratch the surface and see things anew. So we've got time for I think a couple more questions uh, before I'll, I'll wrap up. But um, we have here one from David. Alice, can the huge amount of historical data I think you said there's ten tons uh, collected at Halley be used in any way? Uh, I think it's quite. A quick answer to that. I mean, I'm not a scientist, so apologies to any scientists listening who think I'm wrong about this. But I would say, kind of, it's been it's been used. You know, that there, there was a process of of processing this data after the IGY, and the the way that it's been used is to to set the foundations for a lot of Antarctic science. And that's true of any station that was doing work during the IGY. So I don't know that there's anything that kind of needs to be done with it today. Um, but as I said, it, it lays foundations and it provides that basis for the, the continuous work that, that we're still doing today. Thank you very much. And oh, I think one more question, if we have one available. <laughs> Looking at our producer, <laughs> question there, the burning question that we can we can share. Just looking for, for that. Okay, I think I think we may be out of questions. So I would love to thank our speakers uh, very, very much. So Alice, Henrietta, Daniela, thank you so, so much for uh, sharing your expertise, sharing your knowledge and uh, your insights into the uh, Antarctic past. I'd also like to thank very much, there's a battalion of people behind the scenes here who have made this happen. So thank you to Pint of Science uh, for uh, uh, enabling us to have our polar Pint of Science. Um, also the team behind the scenes here, um, too many to mention, but uh, they have all made this happen very smoothly. And uh, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, to work with you all. Um, there are two more of these, uh, Polar Pints of Science, um, and the next one will be uh, tackling the present, um, and the, thereafter we'll be looking to the future. So it's been an absolute pleasure um, to be host tonight. Um, thank you to the UK Polar Network and to uh, the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust. Uh, please do uh, click on the links, follow the hashtags. You'll find um, underneath my face here uh, some of our hashtags and, and Twitter feeds. Please do find out more about our organisations. We do great work, I can, believe, I can tell you. But thank you very much for joining us tonight. I think we had up to uh, almost 200 people, so it's wonderful to have you all here from across the world. So thank you and good night. Thank you.